All right, next up we have Maria Bassels, who is from Bucknell University, <laughs> who's going to be talking to us about moving from A to B. All right, thank you. Um, is this loud enough on the mic for the people in the cheap seats? Yes, okay. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm sorry, I have no PowerPoint. Uh, you'll just have to look at me, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, I'm going to, the general overall, uh, Idea for this paper moving from A to B, should be no surprise. I'm trying to, uh, I don't think I'm gonna defend the B theory, but I'm going to try to propose some way for a B theory to uh, lose this horrible, uh, uh, I think misnomer of being a static rather than dy dynamic theory of time. Um, and I'm going to do so by focusing on uh, one particular kind of small argument, but um, hopefully it'll have greater repercussions that I will gesture towards at the end. Okay. So dynamism, animation, becoming, these are all terms that have been used to describe some aspect of our temporal experience and both the general character and the particular experiences thought to have these properties have been the focus uh, in the debate, between, have been a focus in the debate between A and B theories of time. Um, typically, these experiences have been taken by the A theorist to be proof of an indispensable element of time that is absent in the B theory, namely the element of temporal passage, um, and normally cashed out in A theoretic terms as something like a moving present. We'll call this A passage. So one task of the debate, um, grab this. Uh, one aspect of the debate has been to pinpoint uh, the actual phenomenology. Oh, that one's wrong. There we go. Thanks. Got it. Um, the actual phenomenology to which these terms apply. Um, some hold that we do, in fact, have an experience of a passage, perhaps not tied to a particular sense experience, but to the general character of our experience. Others hold that while we do not have a direct experience of a passage, we do have experiences of dynamic movement um, and change that can only be explained by the existence of a passage. These experiences require more than just an object um, being in different states at different times, what we might call B change, but that the different times themselves have their own coming into being or coming into the present um, made possible by a passage. And we can refer to the change produced in this manner as a change or even maybe dynamic change more, more uh, um, prevalently. A theorists who make this move will take the experiences of dynamic change to be indirect evidence of temporal passage. So here's where I'm going to focus on a more narrow argument. There's no slides, just me, just me, and, and hand gestures. <laughs> All right, so in his book, Experiencing Time, Simon Prosser offers an account of why we seem to experience dynamic change. Um, it is not, he argues, because we have a direct experience of A passage, nor because we actually experience this kind of A change. Um, in fact, he argues against our very ability to experience temporal passage with what he calls his detector and multi-detector arguments, which I'm not going to be getting into here. Um, and that are not uncontroversial, but the two arguments capture a general position that what well, he says, quote, experience cannot distinguish between different ontological theories of time. And again, that itself is an open question that I'm not going to get into here. Okay. Um, but later in his book, Prosser claims that those same arguments that he uses for a passage can be used to argue against the experience of dynamic change um, because of what he, what he sees as a logical equivalence of dynamic change and temporal passage. Um, that's arguments work against both temporal, against both temporal passage and dynamic change, what I was earlier calling a passage and, and a change. He says, quote, it's clear from the assumption that time passes if and only if change is dynamic. If dynamic experience could be said to represent change as dynamic or time is passing, it would have to represent a necessarily uninstantiated feature of the world and would thus have a necessarily false content. Okay, um, so thus he resists the move of B theorists even who argue that our experience, uh, experiences of temporal passage and or dynamic change are illusory because he holds that we simply do not and could not have any experience of a passage or a change 
even an illusory one. Um, so, um, right. So you might think uh, whatever we mistakenly, uh, whatever we think we're experiencing um, as, as dynamic change, it's not an illusion for Prosser. So he says we can't even experience that. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. So with the experience of either temporal passage and dynamic change off the table, we're faced with the question of what it is that we are experiencing when we think we're experiencing temporal passage or dynamic change. And Prosser argues that, quote, change is experienced as dynamic because the experience of change involves the representation of something enduring through the change, end quote. So Prosser holds that our tendency or inclination to represent an object as a single enduring object traveling through those various states um, of being results in the representational content and thus the phenomenological character of an experience of motion being one that contains a necessary falsehood, but one he thinks that, um, but one which we can actually, uh, that can actually be represented in experience, unlike, according to him, uh, temporal passage and dynamic change. For Prosser, the representational content in the experience of an object enduring through change includes something like A is F and A is not F, where A is taken to be one and the same object and F and not F are two um, uh, distinct states. For instance, if you have a passing car, A is, is in some position, say in front of a lamppost, and then in another position, not in front of the lamppost, right? We come uh, to have that uh, uh, false, what he says, necessary falsehood of A is, ca the car is in front of the lamppost and not in so we come to represent a necessary falsehood by representing one and the same object um, as being in those opposing states. It's not that we come to have an experience of dynamic change as such, but that we experience dynamic change by way of experiencing um, objects as enduring. And although he argues um, that we could experience neither a passage nor a change nor temporal passage nor dynamic change, because both involve the representation of a necessary falsehood, he holds that there's a marked difference between the necessary falsehood represented in say something like a round square and the necessary falsehood represented in an experience of an object enduring through change. The latter representation of a necessary falsehood, he argues, is possible because of its diachronic nature. Okay, so in this paper, I'm focusing on the claim that one, the cause of our seeming experience of a change or dynamic change is our natural tendency to represent persisting objects as enduring rather than say perduring. And two, that by representing an object as enduring through change, we represent a necessary falsehood. I begin by examining process argument in two ways. So first I consider whether the representation of endurance can in fact be read off the phenomenology and whether it's supported by findings in some of the science of motion detection. And second, I argue that even if we were to represent um, an object as enduring an experience, it's not at all clear that this would actually give us the kind of dynamic change that Prosser claims is logically equivalent to temporal passage. Um, and so from here, the sort of gesture part. So from here, I consider that there seems to be an important feature of a diachronic representation that allows for its representation, namely that it's diachronic. Um, and this feature, I argue, should be utilized by the B theorists as a way that we can understand dynamic change, not as being the necessary falsehood that Prosser considers it, uh, but instead as an opportunity to develop an understanding of our experience of dynamic change that is not, say, tied to a theoretic passage. Um, and so by utilizing Prosser's discussion of um, what he calls, the, or what many call the dynamic snapshot model, um, whereby the content of experience can include an instantaneous vector rate of change, I offer, I offer up an alternative description of the representational content, which I hold more aptly reflects phenomenology. And lastly, I'm gonna just offer a rough sketch of how one might bring that alternative description of the phenomenology to bear on a B-theoretic understanding of change is perhaps describable either in the language of being, something like at, at change, or maybe something like in the language of becoming where we wouldn't get that contradictory content. So thereby, we might be able to reinsert dynamism in the world in a way that does not require a theoretic temporal passage. Um, much of the literature on temporal passage and the phenomenology of dynamism has focused on a common illusion, which I'm sure I know many of you are familiar with, the phi phenomena. I'm using that in the sort of uh, 
way it was used for a long time. So in the five phenomena, we have the two dots flash sequentially, and they induce that experience of a single moving dot. Um, what makes Prosser's view attractive when analyzing this particular phenomenon is that our brains have mistakenly two distinct objects to be that one singular object. It would seem tempting and reasonable to think that our seeing the two distinct flashes as one object is at least in part responsible for us experiencing the dynamism of that motion. Okay. However, although the particular name we give this phenomenon is of no great consequence, the, other, the overlook of another remarkable phenomenon may be of particular philosophical interest here. Um, and this has been discussed by a handful of people in philosophy of time. In, in 1912, Wertheimer originally describes the phi phenomenon as a novel phenomenon of pure motion, that is motion without an object. So it gets this, it sort of gets this uh, misnomer uh, called the phi phenomenon gets associated with the scene of a singular, um, what we would call apparent motion of a singular dot moving across uh, instead of two distinct flashes. But um, the original uh, name phi phenomena was associated with this pure motion. So Prosser himself acknowledges this phenomena and other related phenomena in his argument against the retentional and extensional views of temporal phenomenology and in favor of uh, the dynamic snapshot view. However, he doesn't, dis uh, ex I'm sorry, he does not explicitly bring those discussions to bear on his discussion of endurance, which is, I find um, strange. So Harl and Arstilla emphasize this phenomena, the pure motion phenomena, when decoupling the mechanisms responsible for motion experience and object representation. So the kind of pure motion phenomena occurs. So instead of having flash flash, and then you see the single dot move across, um, uh, two dots are flashed quickly enough that the viewer has an experience of motion in the general area between the two dots, but not motion of the dot moving across the path. So to illuminate what's going on here and the role that object representation plays in experience of motion, I'm gonna now turn to uh, some of the physiology of early stage motion detection. So Mather, George Mather um, explains that the neural substrate for motion processing begins with photoreceptors, which are spread across the retina and they're capable of detecting a change in illumination. So just little, like little photon, photoreceptors, right? So on off. Um, so they're capable of detecting a change in illumination. For instance, when an object moves across the visual field and obscures or exposes background light, or when an illuminated dot appears and disappears. Um, paired together, you have these photoreceptors, they can uh, send a signal to a third comparator neuron. And if received in the relevant ways, the comparator neuron will output a signal that motion has occurred, okay? Um, so we have this triad, two photoreceptors, uh, plus a comparator neuron. And this triad forms a motion detector that is specific to direction and velocity. And the information outputted is only about the experience, uh, I'm sorry, the existence of motion in a certain direction at a certain speed. So it contains no information about an object. These are just sort of little like boom, little arrow. Um, unless interrupted by overwhelming competing information, for instance, about the bodily movement of perceivers, because these things are going off all the time as we move around, right? Um, but then we get that information about our body moving and that, that, the, that information from the, from the motion detectors gets suppressed. Okay. Um, so unless it's interrupted by the competing information, say about our bodily movement, this information is going to be sent along to other processes and combined with information from other motion detectors that may contribute to the formation of a more complete representation of an object moving, perhaps along with properties, say, of color, texture, distance, et cetera. It's the information coming from the various motion detectors, specific, again, to a variety of directions and velocities that contribute to the representation of an object's boundaries and path. The experience of pure motion described by Veritimer is likely induced by early stage motion detectors sending out their signals but perhaps without being combined with sufficient information regarding things like size, shape, et cetera, that would lead to the representation of an object. So although Prosser states that the experience of motion involves a representation of something, again, like A is F and A is not F, that does not seem to be the case when one has an experience of pure motion. So while it's certainly true that this account of pure motion only deals with very early stage motion detection, 
and that the phenomena of objectless motion would not occur beyond that stage, the account leaves open the possibility that motion can be processed and represented independently of an object being represented as undergoing the motion. So more relevantly, that dynamic character of the motion is experienced without the representation of an enduring or even persisting object, contrary to what Prosser is trying to put forward. However, one may argue that although the experience of pure motion may occur without the representation of an object, there's still say something that is represented as maintaining identity through the change. The something in, in the phi phenomena case might be the general spatial location between the two dots. In the absence of, say, a spatial location, maybe even something like the self, um, maybe that which remains the same. Prosser, of course, mentions these possibilities, in, protect, in particular, Velleman's discussion of how the self is represented. Um, however, part of Prosser's argument for this endurantism friendly representational content relies on appealing to object files, which contain information about the various states of the object. So you have these little boxes in your brain, if you will, that sort of Say okay, this is the this is the uh, the car or the dot box, and we're going to put all the, the properties of it, or all the um, yeah, all the properties of it. Say, so um, th this is what he appeals to in putting forth this endurantism friendly representational content. Okay, so according to Knowles, Scholl, and Mitroff, quote, an object file is a mid-level visual representation that in some way sticks to a, mo a moving object over time on the basis of spatio-temporal properties and stores and updates information about that object's properties, right? Um, end quote. So exploring the analogs of object files or things, something like spatial location and the self could help provide a fuller picture of the representational content and whether there's anything like an object file involved in an experience of pure motion. Um, however, since these object files are formed by automatic processes and most often track spatio-temporal continuity, it would be strange to think that in addition to forming object files and that track spatio-temporal continuity, they are also formed for the spatial locations, um, especially given that there seems to be an upper limit on how many object files you can have going at any given time. And so given that object files for spatial locations would be redundant and inefficient, it seems likely that no such object files exist. So Again, you have these object files as part of process argument. You have these object files um, where we're sort of keeping all of these uh, uh, properties or predicates we could uh, attach to uh, the object. And that's part of his argument for this endurance uh, uh, um, experience or this in experience of endurance. Okay. All right, um, so perhaps an alternative to this. So even if, you, if an experience of dynamism is always associated with the representation of some kind of enduring stability, be it object, location, or self, looking at the experience of pure motion and early stage motion processing can still provide insight into the features being represented and possibly allow us to resist process conclusion that that representational content is a necessary falsehood. So recall, Prosser holds that the representational content associated with the experience of dynamic change is that just straightforward contradiction. A is F, A is not F. Again, if we're talking about a car, car is in front of the lamppost, the car is not in front of the lamppost. However, I think it's reasonable to hold that the phenomenology of motion does not always or necessarily contain this sort of representational content expressed in terms of incompatible positions and instead manifests merely as motion even in cases outside of experiences of pure motion. So in, not just those strange specific phenomena where you have it too quick and the brain can't process it um, so, to attach it to an object. Even if I'm watching say a car move, um, it seems to be not always broken down into states. So again, although I might see a car moving along the street and maybe even after the fact describe myself as seeing it first in front of the lamppost and then at the edge of the wooden fence and eventually at the stop sign, the phenomenology also strikes me simply as that of a car moving without unpacking the movement in terms of positional change. Although it may not extend to the entirety of my experience of dynamic change, I think this more aptly it describes at least some of the phenomenology. The description of phenomenology I've offered also might be supported by two perceptual illusions, um, George Mather's two-stroke illusion uh, and the shepherd's tone. So in the former, and this is why I'm sorry, I don't have a, a visual for this. Um, so in the former, so George Mather has a two-stroke uh, illusion where you have just 
it's it's like a very simple flip book, right? Where you have say an image of let's see a photo seemingly taken from the front seat of a convertible on a tree lined road, and then the second is almost the exact image, but the car is just slightly advanced, right? So we did this these two images, um, and then the that's the two stroke illusion. Um, and then the third necessary is a blank screen. So if you're presented just with the two uh, shots of the car and just back and uh, just those two images, you just get this image of the of a person sort of wiggling back and forth in their car, right? Okay. Um, if you get that blank screen, that blank shot as the third frame inserted, instead we have an experience of a car perpetually moving forward. Okay. Um, and, and then, so that's sort of the visual version. And then the shepherd's tone is the, the oral version. So the shepherd's tone uses a complex arrangement of foreground and background tones to evoke an experience of an ever ascending tone. Um, uh, in neither case though, would I describe the phenomenology in terms of the car changing position or the note changing its pitch. Instead, it seems that I'm inclined to describe the phenomenology is that of just a car moving and the pitch rise, right? So, where you have this weird, if you've heard the shepherd's tone, how many of you have actually heard the shepherd's tone? Right, so it's this ever ascending tone and it you can loop it and it just still sounds like it's ever ascending even though the notes at the end are the same as the notes at the beginning. Okay, okay. Um, so returning to Prosser's analysis, we seem to see a tension in his own view. So recall that Prosser holds that the representational content of our seeming experience of dynamic change is a necessary falsehood but one that is possible because it's diachronic. Um, however, in an earlier chapter of his book, he, Prosser advoca advocates for the dynamic snapshot view of temporal experience, which is quote, the theory according to which experience has an instantaneous content that includes vector rates of change. And to flesh it out a bit more, according to Arstilla, quote, because the dynamic snapshot view maintains the, that the content of our experiences are not temporally extended, it cannot appeal to the idea that a single experience includes contents that subjectively appear to occur at different times. Instead, the dynamic snapshot view holds that such contents are not required for temporal phenomenology to occur." End quote. Um, so when Prosser claims that we experience an object enduring through change, he cannot be unpacking the representational concept in terms of states that stand in opposition to one another because that would be at odds with his dynamic snapshot view of temporal experience. So instead, according to his view, the instantaneous representational content is the vector rate of change, which would not be diachronic, not be a necessary falsehood, and not be one of an object enduring through change, uh, through changing states, sorry. Instead, the representational content would merely be one of an object moving, um, like above, uh, we may describe the representational content as A is F, as, as Prosser himself sets it up. But in this case, the, it's the feature of moving or the more specific vector rate, which is not itself a necessary falsehood. And even if we include diachronic, diachronic representational content and get a necessary falsehood, for instance, if the vector rates of change in the content are in opposition to one another, Contrary to what Prosser argues, this would not be the source of our seeming experience of dynamic change, since that dynam dynamism is contained in the instantaneous content, not the representation of the object enduring through the various vector rates of change that, that are contained in that instantaneous representational content. Okay. So to be clear, the description of the phenomenology of dynamic motion cashed out in the dynamic snapshot view of temporal experience is not a theoretic and not at odds with the at, at description of motion most associated with the B theory. The world may be completely describable in terms of at at change. And indeed this kind of positional change is also exactly what our visual motion detecting system is structured around. The photoreceptors that are responsible for motion detection need to have a certain spatial layout on the retina that'll be triggered by the structurally similar spatial movement of an object out in the world. That the visual system works by virtue of these spatial properties does not mean, however, that they are necessarily part of the phenomenology. So to use a loose uh, analogy, the receptors of the eye responsible for color perception function by virtue of the wave structure of the light hitting the eye. Um, we think that the wave structures are part of the world, 
We also think that the visual perceptual system works by virtue of these structures. However, we are not then bound to admit that these wave structures are present as wave structures in the phenomenology. Of course, our perceptual and cognitive systems eventually provide information regarding positional changes in the case of motion, while we're never afforded that same insight when it comes to wave structures. Um, more generally, though, it strikes me that Prosser, by trying to find the source of a false belief that the world contains a theoretic dynamic change, has missed an opportunity here to use that dynamic snapshot view of temporal experience to find a way to describe of an, an experience of non-atheoretic becoming and illuminate how we might understand this kind of becoming as existing in the world. Hence the title of this paper, Moving from A to B, because I suggest we resist this assumption that dynamic change is necessarily atheoretic and utilize the dynamic snapshot um, view of temporal experience to understand how we might have non-contradictory B-theoretic dynamic change out in the world. If we can have a vector rate of change as the representational content of our experience, so too it seems we could have the world itself contain something like instantaneous vector rates of change um, and our ability to describe the phenomenology in these two ways, one where we say, you know, A is F and A is not F, cars in front of the lamppost, cars not in front of the lamppost, or the second way, which would be just the car is moving, may possibly extend, this is, the very, this is my very speculative part, may possibly extend to reflect two logically equivalent ways of describing motion in the world. One that utilizes standard at-at description of motion and another that record, recognizes a kind of instantaneous becoming existent at each moment, but not incompatible with the B theory. And while we typically think of instantaneous velocity as mathematically derivative of at-at motion, it, this is really speculative, it may, be, it may be that they could be ontologically on par with one another. Um, but again, that last suggestion is merely a projection, however, and so goes beyond well, what I could fully discuss in this paper. Right. Thank you. Okay, I won't take that long. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I mean, so one very quick, just suggestion of a, a thing if you're thinking about these issues is um, Zeno's stadium paradox um, is a case where you have things that pass each other without being next to each other. Um, and is interesting if you're thinking about motion without um, that at that thing is, is I mean, particularly since it's Zeno that, that caused us to have so much difficulty with the very idea of instantaneous velocity. Like, that, that's just a sort of interesting place to look. Um, so the thing I wanted to ask about, as it were, is this, this skeptical worry I have with accounts based on instantaneous appearances of movement, which is, so imagine we've got this kind of dynamic snapshot where it feels like things have just happened and they're just about to happen. We just have this awareness as of changiness. If we've got that, and we've got it at a single moment, um, but we don't have a, a genuine change in what, what there is or how, you know, like we're, we're not actually having becoming in the sense of um, a, a change in what time it objectively is we end up potentially with a kind of Parmenidean presentism where there's no need to have the other times because we've just got this time and all the evidence we could, what you know, like all the evidence of, of the times just about to happen and just having happened. But of course, we don't need the other times for that. We, we just get this moment that feels like it's in the middle of something. And so I, I, I wonder if we get, if we get the sort of the feeling of dynamism on a on a static view, um, or or on a on a view that doesn't have like objective change, if we end up with a kind of Parmenidean presentism, I don't know if that makes sense. Thanks. Um, I think I think what my answer would be is I'm not trying to defend the B theory against the A theory here. I'm just sort of saying take the B theory. Can we find some way to 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 say we have dynamism, right? Um, and I can have all sorts of other reasons for thinking that the B theory is true beyond say instantaneous phenomenology or instantaneous, that, 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 that instantaneous me. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, I, for me, I think that my big goal is to, I think the 
C theory has a PR problem, right? Like we, we keep getting called static, right? And I feel like we just want, I want to say the dynamism is there. We just have to find it and sort of convince people that that's what's there, right? Um, so I guess, so I guess my, my question directly, my answer to your question is just that I'm not trying to defend based on this one bit, the whole B theory, but sort of say, take the B theory, can we give a good shape for dynamism being in there somehow? Yeah, thank you. Did that answer your question somewhat? Yeah, cool. thanks. I think it's really interesting. And uh, I just wanted to ask you whether you're amenable to the following. Um, you, you know, su suppose that maybe um, the representation representational contents in perception are not metaphysically specific. And so oh, the not metaphysically? Right. Yeah. So because, I mean, some of what, what you said at the end sounded as if, you know, <laughs> there's a description that we can give along these lines and another description that can, we can give along different metaphysical lines. And it's sort of like the overall spirit of what you're doing sounds to me as though you might be, uh, you know, saying that really we, we're kind of bringing these um, distinctions to, um, you know, a description of perceptual uh, representational contents. I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I, th I think the phenomenology is metaphysically neutral. If that, so, right. uh, and then I think that the way we describe it bound up in all sorts of other, you know, the use of the language of being at the risk of sounding a little out there, the risk of the, the use of the language of being, put it in terms of states versus putting it in terms of becoming, starts to codify these metaphysical systems, right? So I, yeah, so I think that that's, that's a very tr tricky terrain to navigate if you're trying to avoid making big metaphysical conclusions just from those maybe after the fact metaphysically laden like when we when philosophers take over those those concepts that we use and then sort of attach them to the metaphysics it's kind of hard to de disentangle them after the fact so yeah thank you natalia oh. hey uh okay. uh thank you for that um yeah, so my question is actually almost almost the same as what Natalia was asking, but maybe a little more general. So I'm, str I'm struggling with the relationship between the phenom phenomenology as of and representational content as of, right? Like Prosser, for example, in his book, really explicitly says there's no phenomenology without representational content, okay? Like, I I'm not sure what that claim is exactly. Is that an empirical claim? Is that, because conceptually, it seems those two things can come apart. Anyway, I just wanted to see what, what like, what's your comment on on how those two concepts relate to each other? And I'll just, I'll just stop at that. I know you, you, you've given this comment to me, and I haven't. I don't know that I have a, a really. I don't know if I have a good answer yet for you. Um, I am not totally convinced of a representational model. Um, so a little bit of this is in bad faith because I'm sort of talking about it as if it has, you know, representational content necessarily. I think there's a useful way we can unpack these ideas talking about in terms of representational content, um, especially when we're sort of looking at kind of that link between how we describe it and how, like, like I said, whether we describe it in terms of the language of being in, in opposing states versus a vector rate of change. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question fully though. Um, so you, you want just a little bit more about the connection be the, between the phenomenological character and representational content, correct? Is that what you're I'm just I'm just trying to figure out what it means to say that that one necessarily accompanies the other, or are they the same, or are they different? Like what what yeah what's the, what's the status of the when Prosser says that you can't have one without the other? Like what is the the status of that claim? Like that's one way of putting the question, I guess. Like what kind of a claim is that? S Sam wants to say something. Yeah. You you ask. Okay. Oh. I I think. Yeah, let me think about it more. I think it could be, I think you could make a case for it being somewhat empirical, but it wouldn't be sort of like the metaphysical representational theory of mind then. But I think you could make a case for it being something like an empirical claim. Um, 
and and I'm thinking in terms of like these outputs information the the sort of information outputs from the motion processing system and what that if, if you if you were to consider that the representational content maybe it's not representational in the in the more robust sense then that's going to be intimately tied to the phenomenology or in some way responsible to the phenomenology I'm trying to tread very lightly here Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so I totally agree with you that there seems to be a tension in process book, uh, mm -hmm. between, on the one hand, his dynamic snapshot theory, on the other hand, this idea that uh, um, motion is an ex contradictory experience that's made possible because it's diachronic. Um, but so you, you seem to then say, um, reject the second and go for dynamic snapshot theory. Um, which, yeah, you know, like I, I just wonder a little bit maybe what already Jeremy has said in the same vein a little bit that I'm not clear whether this vectorial property would give you a phenomenology of motion or what the phenomenology of that would be. But my main question, I put that to the side. My main question is, you see, you seem to pick that because you're saying um, that would give you a dynamic theoretical account of change that right well i'm sort of saying let's try to see if we can extend this so um, okay so uh, but how how does this dynamic snap theory, theory with experiencing this vectorial property give you more dynamic b account of change experience if it i guess it depends on what you mean by dynamic right so if you're taking it to be that a theoretic dynamism where time itself has to undergo some kind of change. I'm not going to give that to the B theorist, obviously, but in trying to find um, a way to understand, I, I'm just going to say becoming in this case, right? So if you could have, if you could understand how becoming, say, could ex exist in a moment or at an instant, maybe, right? And represent that with that vector, right? Um, that would be enough to say that the B theory isn't just a bunch of stuff all sitting there, right? Scattered across these instances. Right, but that's the tricky bit, right? That's the tricky bit. So I think it, you know, I think to, to be perfect, like sort of just be kind of maybe a little sloppy here, but just to put out the, the intent. When we start, when the, 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 the contradictions are all coming about when we talk about two distinct instances, instance, and, and two distinct states, right? Um, so if we can get that kind of becoming, the kind of change packed into the instant itself, we can have it in a sense sitting there as the B theory would have it, but it would have its own kind of contained to a moment becoming. And, and it's gonna be hard for us to talk about it because we're all very much bound up in the language of being rather than states, rather than that kind of becoming that could happen in an instant, the transitory that you might be able to have just in some, in a, in, in a sense, just sitting there in the whole four dimensional uh, space time block. Um, but it's in a sense, not just sitting there, right? That's that's the, the further intent. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks. So this is yeah going the same direction. So I, I like the idea of, of uh, you know, defending the B theory from, uh, what might be called a Bon Jovi objection that it gives time a bad name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so I always thought, that, okay, there are two ways to, to defend it, uh, defend it, the B theory from this objection. One, one is saying like, uh, look, there is becoming, but it's a uh, mind dependent. Uh, there and is becoming, is it? So there is becoming, there is a flow, but it's mind dependent. And uh, so, and that's all what we need for explaining uh, the phenomenon okay mm -hmm. so it might even be mind constituted you know uh maybe through representational content or or i, I would prefer like a no representational account but it's fine uh, or you can go the other way and say like no there is becoming and that and it's not mind dependent uh and still you know there is no privilege uh, present things like that right so i guess 
<laughs> my question is, uh, where where do you sit here? I mean, I'm like... sit, I want I want the coming in the world. I don't want it okay. to be mind dependent. I'm trying to, so I'm trying to get that mind dependent becoming and try to that the, it's it's a little easier to bite, you know, to take than than saying it's out in the world. But I want to see if there's any way that we can say no. We there is there is dynamic. There is becoming in the world. It just maybe doesn't look like how the A theorists have unpacked it, right? And it's there in that B theory. It may not look like, it may not look on the surface, right? Um, my partner likes the phrase, we may have mistaken the map for the terrain. So we take the B theory as the map and then we've mistaken it for the terrain because the model say, doesn't seem yeah. to have something in it. But I wanna say maybe we can find that dynamism in there. And it's not just mind dependent, but that is, there is there is becoming in the world, and not a theoretic becoming. So yeah, I sit on the. That's, that's what I want. That's the big ask. Okay. But this is just the beginning, hopefully. Of... <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so this might just be an invitation for you to say a little bit more. Um, so I'm thinking about the dynamic snapshot model and whether you need or want that. And then we've got the possibly separate issue of the talk of experiential vectors. Because I know Simon Prosser in his work, he kind of wants to criticize specious present theorists for taking too much for granted. He doesn't actually want, and from conversations with him, doesn't like that people now call him a dynamic snapshot theorist but he's insistent that there's a place for this kind of vector content in experience. And I was just trying to get clear on with what you're trying to present in terms of becoming, do you think for that, what, what you really want is that this is gonna be instantaneous experiential content and also that we can explain it in this kind of vector way or is your main interest look, we've got this kind of experiential vector in some sense, which can explain these aspects of a phenomenology. It seems to go hand in hand with the kind of snapshot view, but it, it doesn't need to. So I'm just wondering where you sit there. Right. So I, um, I think when I'm, it's, it's a little bit, um, I guess I'm, I'm sort of using the word a little bit slipperly by using instantaneous, right? Because the con, so say we just take something like the, the early stage motion detectors and we have these neurons fire and then there's just like this little information packet and that exists for a while, right? Um, it's not like the, I'll, say, I'll just use this language, the vehicle doesn't just like exist for this instant, right? Um, but the content itself is not temporally extended in the sense that it's sort of playing out some path say of of an object right so that's that's all i really want from by by saying instantaneous that it is not temporally extended in in the sense that it's uh, playing out a path for say consciousness or something like that um i don't know if that answers the full of your question is there even time for me to follow up okay so i guess more of a point would be could it still have that? So if if you thought that there was motion detection separate from location detection, but also motion detection based on location detection, would that in any way, shape or form be actually upsetting for your view that you're putting forward? Or can you say, no, no, look, it may be consistent with all of that. Even if you were to say that the content an experience is temporally extended. That's one thing, but what I'm trying to do here in putting becoming in is or can be consistent with that, as long as what we're thinking of here has this kind of vector-like content. It's just, it might seem more naturally to go with a view on which there's not also the temporally extended content. But if someone had that view, look, they could still make use of what I'm appealing to. When I, I'm yeah, I think I think that's right because I so I I think that the dynamic snapshot view is an easier pill to swallow, especially if because like the my, idea of mind independent, uh, mind dependent becoming is an easier pill to swallow. I think at that stage, right? So 
if you don't buy this dynamic snapshot model of 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 temporal experience i think you can still go for the bigger thing that i want to go for which is the, the idea that there's the coming in the world so it's not so it's not necessarily bound up with um the dynamic snapshot of temporal experience but i'm using that as a stepping stone to sort of say let's apply that same thing but if if you were to reject the dynamic snapshot i might still oh, well i'd like to eventually have arguments for why the world could still be that way even if say our uh, the, the model of, of um, uh, temporal experience we chose was, was different. Is that, uh, thank you for that. Did I miss anyone? Is there anyone in the chat? No. 